so, so how, how does PCA work in practice? Well, here's a little example. So this is flow of oil in a pipeline. So there's some oil in a pipeline, and it's coming directly out of the oil field. So it's not just oil, there's gas, and there's water in it as well. Um, and the interest is knowing how, what sort of domain it's flowing in. So there's these 12 sensors, which are gamma ray sensors. They're measuring like reflections. I think they're gamma rays. They measure reflect. In particular, if they hit a surface, they'll tend to have a reflection coming off the surface. Um, but I guess they're measuring density as well. And there are three different domains in which the oil can flow. So one is all mixed together. That's like a turbulent flow regime. And then there's two which we'd call a laminar flow regime, one of which it's in stratified, so gas obviously on the top because it's light, is then oil and then water. And then there's one which is annular. This, this example is used in Chris's book. It's actually a, an example by Chris Bishop. Um, so oil on the outside, uh, so gas, uh, water on the outside, oil in the middle, and gas in the center. And you've got, like, I think 12 measurements of these gamma ray things. So this is a 12-dimensional vector. And then the question is, can you visualize the different flow domains in a lower dimensional space? So here's the result of doing PCA and looking at the first two principal components. So what you see here in the blue is these uh, homogeneous flow regimes. And they have their own little clusters. They're the most complex form. Um, and what you see in the green and the red is uh, either, I can't remember which is which, one stratified and one's uh, annular. They're much similar to each other because they've got the same sort of reflecting things going on. So you've got a 12-dimensional data set which is difficult to look at, and here's a way of reducing its dimensionality and looking at two dimensions. Now, standard PCA does that. The advantage of the probabilistic formulation we, we've shown is what happens if some of those values are missing? They're not in this case. There's no missing values, but you can get missing values in data. It's very common. If you've got a probabilistic interpretation of the model, there's a probabilistic formulation you can do with an EM algorithm doing fill-in to fill in these missing values that's completely correct. Uh, so what I'm showing you on the right is I've artificially extracted 10%. So they're just the first two principal components. So they're x. Yeah? And it's actually, it's rotated slightly across these two, but the form's the same. And that's because it's, well, they must be similar in value, these two eigenvalues. So this is x1 and this is x2. So q is 2. And here it's done some fill-in for those missing values. So, OK, so the clusters aren't so well defined anymore. They're starting to push out a little bit. There's a bit more overlap between green and red, but fundamentally, despite the missing values, you can still do the visualization. And you can even fill in missing values using this model. And that's a good way of dealing with missing values, to do probabilistic principal component analysis and fill in the missing values uh, for use in another algorithm. So this is 20% missing values. And again, you see that the structure of the data is less clear you got less information, obviously. And now 30% missing values, even less information. These clusters are becoming more and more diffuse. 50% missing values. Yeah, there's a real overlap between green and red. Blue is becoming very diffuse. But you can still sort of see the structures there, even though we've removed half the measurements. And that's the advantage of a probabilistic model, is that you can still do something even when you've removed a load of stuff. And I guess the final thing to say is there's another model called factor analysis. Factor analysis is extremely similar to PCA. The main difference in factor analysis is that the noise is different in each dimension. So up to now, I've been showing you this spherical noise. So the way we draw this is So a spherical noise on these axes, or in high dimensions, is just a little Gaussian ball. It's the same in all directions. Now what's going on with factor analysis is you allow this ball to vary along the axes, like this. So you end up, it's a, it's a sort of, whereas PCA is adding some direction there, yeah, 
and then putting a bit of noise on it to get some result of the covariance model. Factor analysis is some direction there, but then might add noise that's elongated along one axis. It's a reasonable thing to do. The nasty thing about it is it prevents the solution by an eigenvalue problem. It makes actually the solution much harder. Uh, but people use factor analysis. It's very widely used in social sciences. Uh, it requires an iterative solution because of not being able to do this um, eigenvalue problem. The covariance form for factor analysis is WW transpose plus D, where before D was sigma squared I, but now D is sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, sigma 3 squared, with zeros in the off diagonal. Okay? Very strongly related model. But can't be solved by an eigenvalue problem. Okay, and that's the paper. published on principal component analysis. Uh, <coughs> Pardon? No, his PCA is much earlier than this. This is the probabilistic interpretation, which is for me, sorry about that, no idea why that's happening. Let's see if I, yeah, there, it's fixed it. Uh, I mean, okay, you can see similar crap, right? So he's using S for the sample covariance. This is actually a very readable paper as papers go, published in top journals. He's using natural logs instead of logs, but look at these things, okay? You recognize that, yeah? We're even using the same notation. Uh, so Mike in this paper talks about the fact that you can do missing data. Okay, this is the stationary points of the log likelihood. This is the derivation I haven't given you. Yeah. And I, I ignored that R. That's R was the one that appeared in the uh, single value decomposition. And then this is how you prove that the, this is the solution for the discarded eigenvalues. Yeah? So you should recognize all this. I mean, uh, so, okay, this is uh, old now. It's 12 years old. But this is a classic paper. It's very well written. Mike's excellent at writing. So is Chris. And they wrote this together. Um, and it's a fantastic piece of work. So there's her telling the original com principal component analysis paper. And here's Pearson, the material I was telling you about where he was trying to fit X and Y together. So that's 1901. Um, so there's <laughs> 66 years. I said 62 last time, didn't I? <laughs> Between the publication of PCA and the understanding of this probabilistic solution, which I believe is the right interpretation for PCA. You know, other people might argue differently. Um, so I was, uh, I was at Aston University when they did this work. Uh, and, and here's Mike doing um, uh, some visualizations with PCA. Um, doing uh, 100 missing values. So this is the examples I've just shown you, but Mike's doing it with a, a virus data set, and then he's got missing values in this one, but no missing values in this one. So you can see these data points are moving slightly. 10 and 30, 30 and 16 are here. 10 has actually moved out from somewhere. It must be in here. But you, know, you, you get similar structure in the model. So that's exactly the thing I was showing you with the oil data there. Um, very nice paper. Anyway, okay, so onwards, ever onwards, if I can get rid of this. Why is escape not working? <laughs> ah! Okay, now I'm stuck forever talking only about this paper. Die. Shouldn't escape get me out of this. Uh, page navigation properties, hide toolbars. Ah, oh, no. <sighs> okay, that's full screen, out of full screen. Thank God. We can proceed after all. 
So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about my own research and try and show you how, you know, from simple things, complex things do arise. So we've talked, we've talked, <laughs> or alternatively, we've talked uh, about um, high dimensional data and, and linear dimensionality reduction. So I'm going to throw a bunch of stuff at you in this final lecture, which you know you might not understand, but if you swallow some of the concepts, that's fine. You're not going to be asked technical details of this stuff. It's supposed to excite and inspire you. So I want you to see you're excited. Uh, <laughs> so linear dimensionality reduction is what we're doing, trying to fit planes and lines to data. But I want to sort of use this example to motivate why you might need to go beyond that. So this is a talk I gave uh, about eight months ago, but I've given versions of this talk several times. This is a digit, a handwritten digit. Okay, so it's got 64 rows and 57 columns, um, and it's from a well-known digit data set. So this space, if you sample from it, if you take independent samples per pixel, so you come up with a model that says every pixel is independent and is on and off with probability associated with the number of pixels. So effectively, you fit a binomial model to the data. You don't see the six. Um, and okay, that is a pre-sample. It's on the slide. But even if you sampled every nanosecond from now until the end of the universe, you would never see the original six. The reason being is because there's two to the 3,648 possible images in there, which is such a large number because the 3,648 is in the exponent that you're never going to see that six again. In fact, you'll never see anything that looks like that six. So that tells you it's a pretty dumb way to model a six. Yeah? Because that space could be anything. It could be a picture of one of you. Not a very high resolution picture, but it could be. So here's an alternative idea for how you might model a high dimensional digit. So you might take, someone gives me a six, and I'm going to model all sixes, and I might say, well, a six is still a six if it's rotated slightly. And maybe I think that's how sixes are represented. You take some prototype six and you rotate it left and right. So that's what we're doing here. So that's my model of six. So interestingly, if I take a six, and here we've done some PCA on this, what I'm creating here. So in this image here, I think that one of these sixes along here is the original six. And then I've created a data set by rotating that six 360 times. Okay, so each data point is a rotation of the six. And then I've done principal component analysis on the data and plotted the first two principal components. So the crosses are the locations of those principal components. Now, what do you see about those crosses? What are they forming? A circle. Yeah. In fact, they're forming a circle with a little bit of noise at the sides. You see how it's not quite on a circle. Does anyone know why there's a little bit of noise there? Why it's not exactly a circle? Anyone think why that is? Fun? Absolutely right. Very good. Aliasing. As you rotate the image, you don't quite rotate all the pixels. So you have to do a bit of interpolation to decide what's a pixel and what isn't. And you could even really see this structure in this visualization because here, 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 and here are the rotations that are closest to 90 degrees where the interpolation is having the largest effect because pixels are jumping from one place to another. And you see that slight, you can just make it out if you squint. The noise is slightly larger at the points at which the rotations are very close to 90 degrees. So there's an aliasing effect. Um, okay, so some of those weren't sixes. So now I'm claiming this is a model of sixes and nines. Down here are nines, up there are sixes. Now, uh, pure rotation is too simple a model of a six, right? Sixes do many more things than that. So I, I would also, but I'd say this is a good idea. You just need to add more distortion. So thinning is when the width of the stroke gets smaller and larger. So how fat your pen is. Uh, translation, moving a six around, whatever. There, if it was a seven, the presence or absence of a cross stroke, yeah? But the argument is that for any data with structure, and this is a self-referential thing, because I'd almost define data with structure to be data for which there are fewer distortions than there are dimensions. Now, each one of those distortions will add a new nonlinear space that we need to worry about. 
So if there are fewer distortions I dimensions, then we expect the data to live on a low dimensional non-linear manifold. So PCA has been looking for linear manifolds. And in fact, of course, this is not a what PCA has done here is it's found well, look at this circle. It's it's looked at this space and it's found this big circle and it's tried, it's fitted a plane across the circle. It hasn't fitted inside the circle across all these points. So this is 3,648 dimensional data and we're just looking at a plane sliced through it, which is showing us the circle. In fact, as you, if you look at higher principal components, you just see spirals. You just keep seeing this one dimensional structure of something that's gone around in a full circle. But we need something that does non-linear things. Okay, so there are a bunch of methods in machine learning that I don't want to talk about too much. Um, one of my inspirations is generative topographic mapping that, again, people were working on when I was doing my PhD. Uh, the first year of my PhD I did at Aston, and that was in 1998. So you can see it was an amazing place to be at the time. Uh, so what I want to introduce is something that I've worked on which, uh, in some sense, I've given you a lot of the tools for understanding. Um, it's probabilistic, nonlinear version of PCA. Now, a key problem, how could you do? How did we make regression nonlinear? Can anyone remember? Basis functions. Very good. What do we do? We took that x and we replaced it with a phi, which was a nonlinear function of x, and we can still integrate out w because it was always appearing w transpose phi of x. Yeah. So that's kind of an interesting potential way of making PCA nonlinear. Do the same thing, and we get a nonlinear model, nonlinear manifolds. But if you put phi of x in, unfortunately. You're now placing a Gaussian prior over x, which is inside phi, where phi is a nonlinear function. So you can't do that integral anymore. It's no longer tractable. So these techniques here, density networks and generative topographic mapping. So it works for probabilistic PCA. They're ways of trying to do that approximately using sampling, Monte Carlo sampling. Um, and propagating the samples through the network. I'm not going to go into the details any more than saying that. So, because the difficulty for these probabilistic approaches is if you push a probability distribution through a nonlinear function, and let me try and sort of sketch out what I mean by that. So, if I have a probability distribution and then I have a nonlinear function, so that goes in here and comes out the other side. This will lead to a fantastic, general, really interesting no uh, probability distribution that I won't be able to normalize. It's a really powerful way of coming up with interesting probability distributions, which could be multimodal, non-Gaussian, heavy-tailed. You can make, come up with transformations to turn that Gaussian into anything you like, but you won't be able to normalize it. And since you can't normalize it, you can't compute the likelihood. Normalization is crucial in doing maximum likelihood. So when you introduce basis functions, that's what happens. You lose the closed form likelihood. You have to use approximations. So what I'm going to first do is show you how I reinterpreted PCA, probabilistic PCA. And you should really understand this. And then you should also be able to understand how I was able to make that version nonlinear and lead to nonlinear probabilistic PCA. So I use Y for data. Sorry about that. I think T is a stupid thing to use for data because T is time. But Chris Bishop uses it. Trevor was using it. But in my own talks, I'm using Y. That's slightly confusing. But W is the same thing as it has been before. And X is the same thing as it has been before. And all these notations are the same. OK, I'm using small n for number of data points and P for data dimensionality, Q for latent dimensionality. And then, as we've sort of been seeing, I like to use these matrix representations. So the covariance of a data set is given by n minus 1, y transpose y. And then in a product matrix, which is of the form that we saw, so here I've used y, but remember we saw xx transpose. That's an inner product matrix in the latent space. 
or in the input space, we saw that for linear regression. So that's what I call an inner product matrix. This is P by P, and this is N by M. So linear latent variable models, what we've been looking at is your data is represented by a linear mapping from X to Y plus noise, where the noise has some spherical variance. That's what we've been deriving. Probabilistic PCA, we have this likelihood, and as a standard latent variable approach, we define a Gaussian prior over X. This is what we've been looking at. Don't worry about the graphical model representation unless Trevor covered that. Um, and then this leads to the likelihood we're interested in. Instead of a probability of T, it's probability of Y here. So likelihood, that's a relationship between our data, our latent variables given W. Here's our prior over X, the latent variables. And this is the thing we derived last time. Mu, I'm ignoring it. I'm assuming someone's already centered the data because mu is always the mean of y slash t, so I'm ignoring it here just to keep the notation clean. Okay, so the Tipping and Bishop solution in that paper was that this model, which is what we've been writing down, has this covariance of this form, and the log likelihood has this form, and you can solve the likelihood, so we've got this additional R that I didn't show when I talked about the solution, but it came up on the question on singular value decomposition. And R is an arbitrary rotation matrix. We normally take it to be I, um, but there's the solution for W. That is the maximum likelihood solution. So that's Tipping and Bishop, and here's how I got a paper. Define a linear Gaussian relationship between the latent variables and data. So this is the same likelihood as before, but here's a novel latent variable model approach. So define the Gaussian prior over the parameters. So that's like linear regression. Yes, yeah, so we did that as well. I told you my research career was based entirely on this, and you didn't believe me. <laughs> define a Gaussian prior over parameters W. Integrate out those parameters, which we've done as well. We happen to do it over a unidimensional output, and this is over a multivariate output. But the result is the same. You just get independence across the outputs and this covariance here, xx transpose. That arises because these w and x is always appear as this inner product. So you get exactly the same form of solution, but instead of w's you've got x, instead of n's you've got p's, the independence is across the data features instead of the uh, data points. So dual probabilistic PCA maximum likelihood solution, so this is due to me, this is the easiest proof in the world because once you have Tipping and Bishop's proof in front of you, you can work through and discover that the solution for X, so now you're maximizing with respect to the latent variables, having integrated out the mappings. So it's a slightly weird thing. Compared to what we were doing before, we're getting rid of the thing we didn't know and then finding out the good mapping between the unknown thing and the observed data. Here, getting rid of the mapping, integrating it out, and then saying, what inputs, given that we've considered all possible mappings in a Bayesian way, what inputs would generate these outputs? Solution for this is also an eigenvalue problem. But now the eigenvalues are on the eigenvectors of YY transpose, the inner product matrix, instead of the covariance matrix we saw before. So how long did it take me to prove this? Not very long. Because if I flip between the two solutions, what do you see that's changing? W changes to X. Y goes to Y transpose. P becomes N. And everything else follows through. Didn't take long to prove. <laughs> But actually, I, I did the entire proof before I noticed that this was the case. <laughs> a bit embarrassing. So it's, it's because of this duality between the representations that W transpose X always appear together. And then the fascinating thing is that these two eigenvalue problems are equivalent. So this was known in statistics before I did this proof, that these eigenvalue problems on Y transpose Y and Y Y transpose can be shown to be the same. One is solving for the mapping, and one is solving for the latent positions. But 
these two are related through the data. So the mu prime q and the mu q, u q, which are the things that come out, are related by the data matrix. So one is trying to find, given your data set, what the latent coordinates are, and one is trying to find what the mapping is. But they're always equivalent. In fact, in the form I've got it, sometimes I call this dual probabilistic PCA, but you could, it's sometimes called principal coordinate analysis in some fields. Okay, so it's a probabilistic interpretation, but a funny one, because now we're trying to optimize with respect to inputs to find our outputs, instead of optimizing with respect to mappings to find our... Okay, but the nice thing is that this has an interpretation as a Gaussian process. Remember from before that our kernel, our covariance function, as I talked, I started introducing these. We introduced basis functions here. We introduced phi, phi transpose, yeah? And so we can make it nonlinear. Well, now we can. Because we're optimizing over x. We're not propagating x through the nonlinearity anymore. X is a point estimate. It doesn't have a density associated with it. So we've got this model of our data, which is, so a Gaussian process is also of this form. Well, this is Bayesian linear regression from what you've seen. We didn't really introduce Gaussian processes properly. But in a Gaussian process, what I said is it's when you've got infinite basis functions along a line. And you end up replacing this x, x transpose with particular functions. These are called kernel functions or covariance functions. But basically, we can introduce the basis functions into this model and optimize with respect to x still. Now, you don't get, you don't get a uh, eigenvalue problem anymore. You get a nasty, complicated optimization. But that doesn't matter so much. Well, you can still do it. You can still try and do it. So here's, here's some results from, uh, these are just different covariance functions. So remember I sampled from the linear model and we saw things like this. So these are different covariance functions. Uh, one we sometimes call the RBF kernel, some people call it other things, but different length scales, different nonlinear functions that you can put in place of that linear model. And this is another one again, which is different covariance. This is one that leads to point symmetric samples. And then this is just sampling for the bias. Yeah, so that you can move the whole function up and down. And you can add all these things together and put them inside this Gaussian process model to come up with all these interesting structures. And so here's one which is adding the bias thing, it's adding some noise, it's adding the smooth function, so it's a noisy sort of nonlinear function. Okay, so... I don't want to spend too long on a Gaussian process, but basically once you've got a covariance function, you have a prior over the type of functions you expect. If I add two data points here, I can now ask for the posterior over those functions. And it does really funky cool things like this. And as I add data, the posterior becomes more confident. And it knows what the function's doing. Here, where it's seen no data, has no idea what the function's doing. Here in this region, it's kind of confident about what the function's doing. So I haven't described how you do this, but I'm just showing you that nonlinear functions, these are, these are infinite basis function models. So over here, all the, all the basis functions don't know what to do. But here, the basis functions kind of know what to do. They know what the weights are. The model's not overfitting, despite the fact that there are infinite parameters in the model. So in dual probabilistic PCA, you've got this structure here, where the covariance is given by this linear model here. This is a product of Gaussian processes with linear kernels. So these Gaussian process models with these infinite bases. And the idea is you just replace that with nonlinear kernels. So here's an example of a kernel function. It's the one I used before in the old lecture. And this is derived by considering infinite Gaussian bases. I mean, when I say Gaussian squared exponential, infinite bases which look like Gaussians, they're not actually normalized probability distributions along the real line. You can also do this for the polynomial basis that we talked about as well. So they're definitely not probability distributions. But you can do it for that. It's just not a good idea because of the problem we talked about with polynomials, that once you go outside minus 1 to 1, they blow up, get very large. <coughs> OK, so what can you do with this? So I've now got just a series of videos and demos. But I'll try and start with a little... Uh,
So this, unfortunately, I can't rotate this. I've lost my MATLAB little rotation things. I've no idea how that's happened. This is a man running. And I've drawn sticks between these points. So this data set is just um, a bunch of a point cloud taken from motion capture data where you've got an XYZ location at every one of those balls, which they've tracked using multiple cameras, the sort of thing they do for movies. I just downloaded it off the web. So because there's three dimensions, and in this case there's 34 points on the body, and each point has three dimensions, there's 102 dimensions in this data. Uh, there's 55 frames in the data as we have it, so there's 55 time points and 102 dimensions. So it's high dimensional data with more, with P is larger than N actually. So you saw him running and what we're going to do is we're going to fit this model I've talked about, this non-linear dimensionality reduction model. And this is where it's really annoying I can't turn him around to the data set. I have no idea how that's happened, but it has. Uh, now, there's some discontinuities here. I will, I, I'll try and explain what's going on in a moment. This is like the first two principal directions, but now there's non-linearity. So this is at x. We've optimized with respect to x, but now there's a non-linear mapping from this space to this space. So there are jumps. Why are the jumps? This is a time series, and as we move across the time series, we'll actually change what this guy is doing on here. But there are jumps because at some points it prefers to break up the time series in order to model the data, in order to align the strides alongside each other. I'll show that. Okay, so now I'm moving. This is the start of the run. He starts in a funny pose, so it sort of puts that over here. But that looks like the run, yeah? Now, in this region here where it has no data, the black is showing high variance in terms of its prediction. So you're seeing the mean, but the model is saying, I don't know what the man was doing. It's just like those regions in the regression where there were no data points. The basis functions don't know what to do. We're visualizing the mean of what it thinks it's doing, but the black is showing us it's with high variance. Where there's data, there is low variance. Now this is the cool bit, which unfortunately won't be very clear <laughs> because I can't rotate the man. Ah. So this bit here, the guy as he runs, he changes angle of run. And what it's lining up is the different angles of run. You can probably just about make that out. It's so much clearer if I can turn him on his side. So it's interpolated across the different angles of run. So as I'm moving here, he's running at an angle that he never ran at in the original data. And it's confident about this. It's white. It's lined up the inputs to the data such that it can be confident about how the man was running there. And it would rather line up all those angles of run together because it gets more likelihood out of that than lining up every single one of the time series. It does line up some of the time series. It can't line up everything, because if it did, as we'll see in a moment, we're going to force it to in a moment, if it did, it's going to be either a spiral, which goes in on itself, and then you get the same problem you get on old long player records, in a groove distortion. As you go in the middle, you're using less distance to represent the man than you are on the outside. So it doesn't really want to do that. What it would really like to do is, is build a cylinder but it's only got two dimensions. So what you're seeing is like a cylinder someone split in two because it's not being given enough dimensions to build the cylinder. So if I go around, I can kind of make him run, but when I go through the black areas, he does something funny. Yeah, so this is the, at the bottom. Uh, this, once I built, this is just such, you know, you can just spend ages making him dance and things. Uh, da -ding, da -ding, da -da -da -ding. Uh, now, there is no other algorithm I know of that can model data like this in this accurate way. No one's done it. This is the only model that can, and it's based on probability. It's based on nonlinear dimensionality reduction down to a small space. There are other algorithms where they're modeling motion capture data, but they tend to use a lot more data. This is very little data. So this is kind of, 
Well, certainly when it was published, it was state of the art. Other, other people have done some other stuff now. I don't know what people would say are the state of the art. So here's a way, um, so we can correct that issue that you might not like that the, the lines are split up. Okay, this is a less likely model. It's been forced, in this case, we've used some tricks to force it to find a representation where the lines all continuously together. Um, I don't want to go into what those tricks are. But you can see what it's done is it's uh, found a representation which looks like a cylinder that you're looking down the middle of it. It didn't do the inner groove thing I talked about, but what it has had to do is map all these points here onto the same place, and they're not. They're different angles of run. So it sacrificed quality of modeling in this region to maintain the different angles of run in this region. But we can now do the entire sort of sequence. If I go around like that, you just see he does something weird as he gets into that zone where he's badly modeled, yeah? So this is useful for tracking, it's useful for animation, it's useful for various things. But, I mean, I like playing with motion capture data because you're watching high dimensional data that you have a really good understanding of. Yeah? There's not many high dimensional data sets I can put up and then you can go, oh yeah, it's got that right. Yeah? But you can see a man walking and you can see that it's got that right. You are looking at 102 dimensional data and judging its quality because you're very used to walking, well he's running, sorry, not walking. But you're very used to how humans can move naturally and you can spot very quickly if a human's not moving naturally. Now there are definitely th areas where he will go weird because there's no constraints on him aside from those that the model puts in. So somewhere his foot goes funny but I think you can't quite see it because of, uh, so yeah, okay, he's funny in that regime, isn't he? So there's no constraint. It doesn't know about humans anything more than what it's seen in the data. So it doesn't know that our feet are a certain length and that the distance between these two points should be fixed. In real motion capture modeling, they put those constraints in. Here, it's just learned that from the data. So that's pretty impressive for a low amount of data. Okay, and here's, um, here's an example where we've added dynamics. So this was, uh, someone else built this on top of the model I'd suggested. And the fun thing you can do here, here, it has used this spiral. Okay. Oh no, it did it again. Here we go. Come on. If I move him there, that should reappear. Okay, so here again, it's used the spiral instead of that um, tunnel, but you get this inner groove distortion effect. But the, the novel thing about this model is we've learnt also some dynamics. So I can play the model. You see it? That ball running around? As well as learning the. Um, so now it's in a region where the data never was. But as well as learning the mapping, we've learned over time how the man moves in this low dimensional space. So even if I start it here, it actually does something head sense to head towards that. It won't always do that. It just happens to in this example. So we've sort of learned the motion. We can try slightly different, but it will tend towards the original motion. So you see as he goes in the middle, of course, it's, it, it, it takes smaller and smaller steps because it's this inner groove distortion effect that it actually, it's got not mo it's got, as it moves across there, the basis functions are much wider than anything can do. So he just ends up taking little steps. Probably not accurately how we would expect him to behave, but it's a consequence of the modeling type. Oh, I think I have to... S Ah, now I know why it's done that, because I did start up with no JVM. Right, okay. Sorry. Let's just check the... Uh, So sometimes this command fails to run. Run. It knows when not to run when there's an audience there. Okay. 
Uh, that, that, what bizarre behavior. This is why I don't like MATLAB and you should all use Python. How can that command run in one window and not run in the other? I don't know. Anyway. Hey, okay. Now we can spin him. Okay, so you see how he changes angle of run as he runs. That's what it's trying to model. That's a difficult bit to model. Okay, so skip, 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 uh, run. Now this is the ultimate. This is the current state of the art version of this model. Because what we did here is we've actually managed to approximately integrate out x instead of optimizing. And it means we can learn the dimensionality of this space. So I haven't given you, using Bayesian techniques, we're learning both the dimensionality alongside these latent points. So we told it to use 10 dimensions, but it's decided to only use four. These dimensions here, five, six, seven, eight, nine, are switched off. And we're looking at two of those dimensions. So here, little interface that allows us to um, select which dimensions to look at. And these two dimensions we're looking at here are ones that makes him run around in a circle. So on one dimension, so the way to visualize this is it's doing that cylinder I talked about earlier. And this is all automatic. So we still got, this is like the back constraint model we saw, but actually here it's got extra dimensions we're not visualizing. So this is, in these two dimensions, it's mainly showing the stride pattern. And I can't remember which is which, but one of these additional dimensions it actually, so you can see part of the stride because we've kept one dimension in, yeah? That's the left, right, and then I think this dimension is mainly about the starting position, yeah? Because he starts in this unusual way. So this new dimension in the y direction, the third dimension, is mainly about allowing, giving a, d a space to model the way he starts. So if I put him down here in this dimension, I can make him look silly in the first two dimension because in one dimension, he's now he's down there. So that's the actual starting position, yeah? But now I, I've constrained him in that starting position, which isn't where he is in the real data. Uh, if we put him back to where he is in the real data, which is around here, he should run better. Still, the things mess up here because of this problem. Ah, no. Because uh, of this problem uh, of the fourth dimension. Because the fourth dimension is taking care of angle. <laughs> That's so cool. In the fourth dimension, look, it's completely factored everything else out and is dealing with the angle. That is, that's lovely. That is a result from about 12 months ago from developing the model further. And uh, I've got a PhD student working on this who's doing some really cool things with this modeling. One of the latest things he's doing, he's looking at, um, I need to get these demos off him, looking at images of human faces and looking at them under different lighting conditions and then allowing the model to learn separate latent spaces for the lighting conditions and the different humans. So it basically builds two latent spaces, one which takes care of the lighting position and one which takes care of which human it is. So you can then go in one latent space, pick that human, the other latent space, pick a lighting condition, and it models a high resolution image doing this. Um, that's just paper that's recently submitted. Okay, so... Uh, So that's my work on this model. Um, and you might think I'm just blowing my own trumpet, and I am. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, the derivations you've been doing, which look very simple, they're the meat and drink of what's going on underneath here. There's additional stuff, complicated optimization. And actually, for the last model I showed, it gets much more complicated. There's some quite advanced 
maths and integrations going on there. But the basic model is almost entirely based on the derivations you've seen, but just applied in, I guess, more novel ways than the standard models we've seen so far. You should be able to understand the probabilistic PCA paper, and you would be able to understand a lot of my paper, my first paper, the 2006 one, on uh, this nonlinear model now. Okay, so oddly, that isn't my favorite work on this setup because other people have picked up and run with the model. And uh, what I think I want to show you, uh, probably in the time remaining of all we have, is just my favorite example. Okay, so first of all, the first people to do this, let me show the style IK video first and I'll, I'll skip through to the. Uh, This is a paper at SIGGRAPH uh, from Problem just of inverse kinematics. shortly uh, after I um, uh, published the model. These guys took it immediately and, and did this. Uh, this is what got me into motion capture too. Inverse kinematics are saying, look, you know, it looks like an artist doll, right? All these unnatural positions. As you move a human around, he'll go into unnatural positions like an artist doll. It takes quite a long time to get an artist doll in a natural position. And, and in sort of a, for animation, this is a problem. So uh, here they're using the GPLVM, the model I've described. And they, in this example, they're doing a, a walk with it. So they model the walk. Now, where you see white is constrained to do what they're telling it to do from the motion capture. But where they just remove the white, they're just filling in using the model. So with those constraints removed, but the legs moving, the rest of the body it's like a missing data problem. What should the rest of the body do? Like the PCA thing I talked about. But here, the rest of the body just walks because it's seen what legs do and it knows what arms do given what legs do. But look, he's taken everything off apart from the feet. So the only input, this is a massive missing data problem. The only input is the feet and look at the body. It's just doing the right thing. Now, you might think, well, many people think that type of modeling is impossible. But you can do it. As humans, you can do it. And this model can do it as well. Massive missing data problem, just provide the feet, show it what walking looks like, ask it to fill in the rest. And why? Because it's doing nonlinear dimensionality reduction in a probabilistic way. Probability allows you to deal with missing data, and nonlinear dimensionality reduction is a sensible model for many data types. But this is my ultimate favorite. Uh, this would also, many people will still today tell you that trying to even do this sort of thing is impossible. If I can find the... Oh, no, where is it? Uh, latent doodle. Can you see anything that says latent doodle? HTML. Baxter. There we go. Okay. So, in this case, this is work by Bill Baxter who took the model. I've never met this guy, but I love what he's doing here. He was working in Japan at the time and he was working in um, a companies that do animation. So this is a guy drawing an animation and they have these boards. You can see he's got grayed out lines underneath it, hopefully. Uh, and then he can obviously change the form of the animation. Um, you know, and has to do another drawing as he goes along. So their idea was this. And this is a simple demonstration of their idea. That you just draw, I think he draws four faces here. Now, the difficult bit of this work, which is nothing to do with me, is each of these lines you draw, you have to map between the faces to create a feature point. So each of these lines is going to have to have some associated data features associated with it. And you see he's changing what the face is doing slightly. So as he draws the lines, he's, you know, that triangle line has moved to a mouth line, and the other lines are doing other various things. So this is a third, and then, in fact, he's going to fast forward it to do the fourth. So the plan is, so this guy's now looking to the left, and then finally he does one looking to the right. So then he models this 
with the GPLVM. That's four data points, and I don't know how many dimensions. The number of dimensions is the number of things he's used to represent the data. And you, this is his latent space, so he set it up. So as he moves the mouse in the space of the drawing, it's also the latent space. But look at some of these things. The lines in the drawings don't map. The correspondence is wrong. So in one, he's drawn it one way, and the other, he's drawn it the other way. So as he moves between the things, the line flips over, or something like that, yeah? So he, he just goes around fixing that. He's just saying, for example, please flip this line over on the right. And then he's got, uh, oh, he's now got a problem with the nose does that, yeah? So the nose flips over at some point. So he does that same thing. He deals with the nose. So this is a feature representation issue, not a model issue. But once he's got the feature representation issue sorted, <laughs> is that not cool? Four data points in probably a hundreds of dimensions, I don't know, or, or 20 dimensions, it's considered impossible by most textbooks. And then he just builds this stamping tool. And then he's got a stamp and move so that you sort of can move the guy around. You know, there were no faces anywhere even close to that. <laughs> Obviously, and sometimes, you know, it goes into a sort of more unnatural thing. So this was published at Eurographics several years ago, I think five years ago. Um, I think the next example he uses is even more fun. He actually now draws insects. It's the same deal. All insects have uh, legs. How many legs do insects have? Very good. <laughs> so I'm into asking questions that my nine-year-old son can answer today. <laughs> Um, so obviously, the, uh, you've got the same problem again. He's just tidying up the legs. Some of the legs are moving around. So he's saying which leg is which and which way it's been drawn in order so that the features are correct. Oh. <laughs> so the head moves or something there. I mean, you can see some uh, funny, right? So. And now he's got it, yeah? He can cover all the range of possible insects covered by those things. And he's doing the same thing. He's got a little stamping tool. And at the, ben, at the end, he has the best bit because then he, uh, he has music. Let's see. I'll turn up the volume. <laughs> so he's just stamping different insects using the same trick, because he, he clicks and then moves in the latent space, yeah? Oh, we lost the, oh, come on. I think we've lost the, uh was actually the end, but my favourite bit is when he puts it all to music. <laughs> uh, I don't know why it blanks out there. It should come in. <laughs> so look, if there's any reason why you should do research, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a lovely example of what you can do with this type of modeling, probabilistic modeling, with once you put all these things together, that's, and that's like the summary of everything I've taught you about. You've seen the basics. We haven't, we haven't done Gaussian processes in detail. We haven't talked about how you do prediction with Gaussian processes. 
in some sense, uh, I've tried to give you a course. Okay, so this is hierarchical decomposition of bodies as well. We do sort of stuff on that, and we're trying to build on that work now. Um, oh, and this is um, here. There's the oil data we talked about a short before and saw with PCA, where these things were overlapping, and this is with the new model. And it basically says, it turns out that this dimension, the second dimension, all the interest is in the second dimension. And these other two dimensions are very linear. There's one nonlinear dimension which separates all the data, and the other two dimensions are linear. So you can sort of learn about the data and that actually find out that there's much simpler representations of your data than you originally saw. So that's it, apart from the marking lab on Friday, next Friday. 9 o'clock, what I'm going to do, I think, is give you times. So the hand-in is before the lab. You need to get your stuff into mole before the lab. And then what I think I'll do is I'll print out the list of the course, and I'll send around to everyone times to come in. It's going to be in G12. I can't remember which one of them in the Lewin lab, where we'll be there. And you'll get marked by the students, first of all, on what your code's actually doing. And then I'll have a quick look at through the marks and resolve any issues uh, to give you a mark and feedback on how you've done with the perceptron code. So that's the only thing uh, we've got left. Um, are there any questions about this or anything else you've seen? Yes, no? That's it. Do you all know everything? <laughs> so if I, go, if, I, if I ask you in the exam to reproduce that video, you'll be able to do it. <laughs> OK. Right, so uh, I'll see you uh, next week on Friday during the marking lab. And uh, yeah, other than that, you sure are also at some point I put up the uh, web page. I hope you've all seen that, the web page where I've been uploading the videos, putting the slides, etc. Yeah? Okay. Thanks very much.